If you can hear this sound, then why should you feel bad for people who build tunnels to private property? Hmm? Hmm? Does they really have to go through a lot? <laughs> <laughs> How the hell are you, mortals? How the hell are you? Yes, a very, very auspicious question that I always seem to ask at the beginning of these. One moment. <laughs> yes, verily, indeed, quite right. And y y you know, folks, I got, I, I gotta, you know, I gotta welcome you to a very special, oh, you know, what are, what are these, uh, episode, but not like a psychotic one, not like you went on some spree, and you, they found you, um, you know, as naked as a jaybird, covered in fire ants. Smelling to high heaven of kerosene behind the BNL country store. Oh boy. And not not there. Not 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 like that kind of uh, episode. But you know like a like a show episode. This is really good. It's it's very good and um You know, I don't really know what it's about. Look, okay, look, 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 okay. So, like, we have an episode, but it's it still needs a little bit more work. So, what we figure we do, we do a shorter episode. You, well, you know, what what we're calling this episode. This is a special episode. It's it's very special because, you know... <laughs> Menti. Anyway, yeah, so, um, I mean, yeah, that, that's why this is a special episode. I think, I think I, I made that very clear. Uh, I think, I, I think I explained it. But I'd like to, you know, actually, I'd like to reinforce how I know that we're not kind of, sort of, not really, but yes, very kind of, in the sense, a local program. Because, you know... Here at the Goal Shed, um, we like to think that, you know, our program is from the graveyard to your home, you know. It has that nice homey feel to it. And not homey like something ugly and putrid, but homey like, you know, it's warm and cuddly. You know, like a porcupine covered in razor blades. That's, that's pretty much our show in a nutshell, mm-hmm. But, uh, we're located, in case you don't know, I'm your friendly mourner from Wickham Corner. Your dead-hearted, socially guarded, never carded, dearly departed, your decomposing, horror-promoting, foreboding, insult-throwing, host of fear and loathing, in short, you're full of rigor. Never been deader, old pal, Gregor the Grave Dagger. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are a local show from Wickham Corner, Virginia, at least in a spiritual sense, because I'm, like, dead. Um, you know, like, physically, my body could be, like, in, in ice somewhere. Behind a dumpster. But spiritually, spiritually now, we're in Wickham Corner, Virginia. Now, Wickham Corner is located 
You know, it's 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 situated, situated what it is. It's situated in Bumpus, Virginia. B U M P. Frickin' A double S. I I I'll, I'll give your brain a minute to um process that. But y y you know, you know, folks. Bumpus, Virginia is more. It is more than just about a place. Yes, sir. It's, you know, it's it's about childhood. Yeah, childhood and mischief and uh, shiftlessness and fireflies and all that jazz. Give me a second. <coughs> uh, and, and occasionally breathing problems for us older folks. Yep, yep, those two. Buddy, you know, it's about those experiences that connect us all, you know. Namely, chasing chickens and running from big, hungry dogs, huh? Yes, verily, indeed. Quite right. Yeah, yeah. A and occasionally, occasionally now. Peeing on yellow jackets. Because, you know, like, seriously, screw them. <laughs> Yeah, Bumpus. So, Bumpus, Virginia. It, it's named after Captain John T. Bumpus. Yes, a pioneer. A pioneer. Not really pioneer, because, you know, like... A guy. He was a guy. He was, he was a guy, and he lived in the area. So, there's a story about how Bumpus got its name. And I'm going to tell you that story. I'm going to tell you that story in just a bit. But first... I'd like to get to our program for tonight. This is, uh, you know, this show, it's, it's going to be about our local area. This is a local celebration of the local. The local Bumpus, Virginia area. Particularly the, well, I mean, I'm in Wacom Corner, which is in Bumpus, Virginia, which is in Louisa County. <laughs> but, you, you know, we're not going to get bring the county into this. The county finds its way into our lives enough, okay? Okay, we don't need to drag them here. But before we get into the amazing place Bumpus, Virginia is, because it's the single most greatest place on the earth, folks. Yes, sir. The rustic capital of the world. Nowhere to be today, USA. Home of the world's largest ice cream spoon. Not really, but it's not like anybody's going to actually search that. <laughs> The Bermuda Triangle of the Backwards Bumpus Virginia. Shut that dog up! Yeah, there's a lot of dogs here. Anyway, so tonight's program is a it's a it's a good it's a it's a shocking um, fright of things, and you will not believe the things that will go into your ears, then come out. The other end. Meaning, you know, like from the left to the right. Not, not, not the... I know what you were thinking. Not that, not that. Anyway, it's a show-stopping show. A show, uh, show shocking, a uh, shocking show of a skull of a show. And don't you mess it. Don't you mess it, folks. And here it comes. It's coming. It's coming. And yeah, it's here. Pachow! I think pachow is a word. Okay. All right. I sure hope I was recording. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Surely you're not nervous. You are? Then perhaps a story might help calm you. I think I know just the one. It's about a cat, among other things. That's why I call the story The Tiger Cat. My story, The Tiger Cat, begins in a little homemade laboratory in a great gloomy old house in the suburbs. 
Young Professor Carl Emery is bending over a cage containing a huge rabbit when the laboratory door opens. Carl, have you seen Ron and Madame Elsa's cat? She's disappeared and Madame Elsa's worried. Mm, uh, what? Oh, it's you, Laura. No, I haven't seen Rana. Oh, Carl, how are your experiments coming? I get so little chance to see you to ask you about that. I'm getting close, Laura. Look in this cage. That's a rabbit. Why, it's as big as a dog. It weighs 40 pounds and it's still growing. My vitamin injections have done that. Then your growth serum's a success. No, not quite. But I will succeed yet. If I can keep my experiments a secret from Madame Elsa. If she knew what I was doing, she'd throw me out of the house. Oh, that crazy idea of hers. That when people die, their cells go into animals. It's insane. It's the old age-old theory of reincarnation, but she believes it absolutely. Then she mustn't find out, that's all. Because once your growth serum is perfected... It'll revolutionize farming. Rabbits as big as horses, chickens as big as ostriches. Why, think how the world's food supply will be increased. And I'll be famous, rich. Then we can admit we're married. Oh, Carl, it's so hard pretending to Madame Elsa that I'm just a maid. That I have no interest in you or a brilliant protege. I know, darling. And it may take months, even years, before my experiments are finished. I know she's left me this house and some money in her will. All our problems would be solved if she'd only die. Uh, so that's how you repay my generosity, is it, Kyle? By wishing me dead. Uh, Madame Elsa. Yes, Kyle. I came in looking for Anna. So you've been deceiving me all these months. Madame Elsa, listen. Get out of this house at once, do you hear? Both of you. Leave this instant. But my animals, my experiments... Get out. Obeyed me. Nothing here is yours. I paid for it all. So get out. Get out. Get out. Oh, catch her, Laura. My, my medicine. She's having a heart attack. Carl, get her medicine. She's in her room. No, I won't. Do. But Carl, she'll die unless you do. Yes, she must die. To solve our problems. It's the perfect answer. Let it down gently. All right, Carl. My medicine. You're trying to kill me. You're murderers, both of you. Another few seconds and it'll be all over. Yes. Yes, but you won't escape. You hear? I'll return. I'll return. And... Carl, she's dead. And all our problems are solved. We... What's that? It's Rana, her cat. She's been hiding in the cupboard there. She knows we've killed Madame Elsa. Nonsense. She's just... Oh, so that's it. What, Carl? Why, the stork has just visited Rana. She's just given birth to a kitten. That's a peculiar coincidence, isn't it? Madame Elsa dies just as Rana's kitten is born. Our story will continue in a moment. At this part of the program, I generally have a little talk with Dr. Weird. But tonight, I'd like to speak with you men. 1944 is over. 45 is here. Even though the sixth wall on drive has ended, your first New Year's resolution should be to keep buying bonds. After that, one of the best resolutions for any man is to decide to improve his personal appearance. Many men are keeping that resolution by getting a new Adam hat. And quality, mister, there's no beating the quality in an Adam hat. Get it? No. Beating. Like literally beating the quality of Adam Hatt. <laughs> I'd kill me if I weren't already dead, which I am. Wow. Ah, looks like Gregor won. Adam Hat zero. <laughs> ah, yeah. And, um, you know, that was a bit of fun, but... The doctor, dear, let's not keep the doctor waiting. And to the strange, Dr. Weird. Ooh. And now to complete my story, the tiger cat. Carl and Laura were completely exonerated of responsibility for Madame Elsa's death. And so he was able to continue his strange experiments unhampered with Laura, his wife, assisting him. Oh, Carl, every serum so far has been a failure. The rabbits, the guinea pigs, they grow tremendously big and we think we've won. And then... And suddenly they shrink back to their former size, as if to mock us. But we will succeed. We must. Oh, of course, Carl. I guess I'm just a little tired. But... Oh, that kitten again. Why can't we get rid of it, Carl? 
It's always behind me, always yowling like that, as if it's trying to startle me. Well, now, Laura. Carl, Madam Elsa believed that when she died, her soul would go into the body of some animal just being born. And that kitten was born at the exact instant Madam Elsa died. Suppose... Suppose her soul is reincarnated in Now, Laura, you mustn't be silly. Look at her eyes. They're the same peculiar green Madam Elsa's were. And her fur... It's the exact reddish-brown color of Madame Elsa's hair. It can't be a coincidence. Laura, you're being ridiculous. If we didn't have to take good care of Rana the Second by the terms of Madame Elsa's will, I'd use her in one of my experiments. But as we can't touch her, I'm going to get hold of another kitten, the same age, to experiment on. Then, by comparing Rana's weight with the other kittens, I'll know how much faster than normal my serum is making the other one grow. Oh, oh we must get rid of her. I have a feeling... Laura, my decision is final. Rana the Second must not be harmed. <laughs> It's only a month since I injected my serum into this kitten, and she's already twice as big as Rana. I'm going to call her Tigress. At the rate she's growing, she'll soon be one. Oh, it's, it's wonderful, Carl, but can't we get rid of Rana now, please? For heaven's sake, Laura, are you still harping on Rana? Why, she's just a kitten, perfectly harmless. I tell you, she sits and watches me as if she hated me. As if she were just waiting for the right moment to be revenged on both of us. See? She knows we're talking about her. Laura, if your nerves don't improve soon, I'll have to send you to Bermuda for a rest. Oh, I'm sorry, Carl. I'll try not to be upset. Oh, that's better. I'm going to give Tigress here another injection. And I predict that in one more month, Tigress will be bigger than any house cat ever seen before on this earth. And Carl finally had to do as he had threatened and send Laura to Bermuda to get over her, her nervousness. Well, in her absence, he carried on his experiments alone and was overjoyed to see the kitten he had named Tigress gain in size at an astounding rate. In fact, when Laura returned at the end of three months, Carl had an astonishing sight to show her. Now, Laura, now, be prepared for a surprise when I turn on the light. Then you really succeeded at last, Carl. Succeeded? Look, look there. Uh, Carl, but that can't be Tigress. Uh, oh, you're playing a joke on me. No, I'm not, Laura. In that special cage is the kitten we named Tigress only four months ago. Now she weighs 200 pounds. Uh, and looks and sounds just as fierce as any wild tiger in the jungles of India. I can't believe it. Look, you see how small Rana looks standing there beside Tigress' cage? Oh, she, she's trying to get out. No, she's not. She's just playing with Rana. She and Rana have become great friends. Rana spends most of her time beside that cage. But I believe that they really talk together. Listen. Well, they are talking to each other. And Carl, look. Rana is pawing at the bolt that keeps the cage shut. So she's trying to open it. Oh, now, Laura, Rana's just playing the way a cat will. Why, I've seen her pawing at that bolt dozens of times. But suppose she did slide it back and the cage came open. Tigress could kill us both. I tell you, Rana's just playing. Carl, no. Rana is trying to slide that bolt back. Laura, am I going to have to send you away? Carl, look. She's got it. Rana's pushed the bolt back. Tigress's cage is unlocked. And Tigress is coming out. Quick. I have a revolver in the library. Come on. An instant later, Carl and Laura had slammed and locked the heavy door of the library. And outside it, Tigress roared in baffled rage. She's trying to get in. She's going to kill us. Ron deliberately opened that cage so Tigress could kill us. She had a plan all along. I'll shoot through the door. That'll drive her away. Oh, you just made her more angry. Oh, she's getting in. She's going to kill her. Look out. Oh. 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 When Carl and Laura were found some hours later, they were quite dead. Ripped to pieces by the strange tiger-like animal the police found in the room, killed by revolver bullets. In fact, the only living creature anywhere about was a reddish-brown kitten with green eyes, like Madame Elsa's. She was calmly sitting beside Carl's body and purring to herself. Have you been unkind to some cat lately? 
You better be careful. There's no telling. Oh, you're leaving. We'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. There once was a man from Nantuck who gave not one solitary uck. And though a good life did he live, not one F could he give. Sorry, fresh out, no luck. <laughs> oh, oh, hi, folks. So, sorry about that, sorry. I was just responding to an email. Mm-hmm. Modern technology, I, I tell you, folks, I tell you. And to think, I still remember when I had to use the, you know, people or me or people or, you know, one or the other, used to troll people directly to their faces. I still remember that. I, I got a good memory. <laughs> but yeah, like to see your little namby pambies try that nowadays. I mean, granted, granted, I'm trolling my neighbor, Morden, right now. But that's out of convenience. Out of convenience. Yeah, 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 out of convenience. I go over there, but, you know, it's, uh, walking from my desk, or, you, you know, whatever this pile of junk I call my desk. Uh, no, no, piece of junk. Piece of junk. Not pile, piece. It's just one solid decaying piece of word, yes, sir, uh, you know, going from there to the door. It's just way too much effort. It's just a way too much effort. Not that, that I don't do work. You're the ones. You're all young folk always avoiding work today. I go to work. I do work. I work hard occasionally. Occasionally on occasions. Can't, can't work hard every day. Can't like, what am I supposed to do? Go to work five days a week? Ha! Ah, give me a second. I'm not like you, you little mortals, with your weak insides who gotta eat to survive. No, no, no. Gregor, Gregor, Gregor the Grave Digger survives on sheer willpower. Just the well alone. Give me a second. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what that was, but it came out. Uh, I'll put it back in later. You know, when you're dead, things happen. Things fall off. Not going to specify what. But you know, you, you power through it is what you do. Yeah, you, you power through it and you just reattach things whenever you can. You, you know, you get one of those army sewing kits... And you know, everything's good as new. Well, yeah, you pick out the maggots, but everything, everything's, it works like a charm. Every time. I've got him pretty good. Pretty good myself doing that. Yes, sir, yeah. And, and what is this? You know what? The, the world has changed. The world has changed since back in the day. Of course, back in the day for me, it was probably, what, like the 1600s, 1700s. But, but still, but still, things, things have changed. And am I the only one that feels like seatbelts are overrated, like airbags, smoke detectors, or, you know, like toxic warning and expiration dates? I mean, come on, come on. You, you can power through that. You can power through anything. If you have the well. Yes. Yeah. And if you're dead. Dead is an important part of that equation. Because obviously, if you were alive. If you were alive, most of that stuff would be very pretty, pretty important. Pretty, pretty important. Not going to lie. Uh, especially like the toxic warnings. Yeah, you don't want to eat that stuff if you're alive. Because of your weak stomachs. As I have mentioned several or one time before. But I will mention many times in the future. And yeah, so uh, a little bit about me. I, 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 like to, I, I like to do art. I do art in my free time. 
It's a good time to do art in the holiday season. Yes, sir. Like, in, in, in this art, I use only the most, you know, ingenious of materials in my art. Um, mainly, like, toilet paper and flaming bags of poo. Which I then decorate my neighbor's house with while he's asleep. Yep, that, that's art. It's art. Some people, some people call it vandalism. Especially when I spray paint, ha 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 You know, all across the side of his house. But that's art. It's just my neighbor and, you know, authorities don't appreciate the art community. Yes, sir. The, um, you know, the underground art community. That does artistic things. Like, um, vandalism. Yes, sir, that. That. Um, and... Yeah. I, I'm not gonna gurgle this one. I, I just need a drink. As you can probably tell by the sound of my voice, it's very wet. And yet very dry at the same time. How I manage it, I don't know. I am just guess I'm naturally talented. I'm just naturally... Gregor is just naturally talented about that. And that's another thing. People who refer to themselves in the third person. I don't I don't know about those guys. Yeah. Uh, Gregor, Gregor just doesn't know about them. They do not get Gregor's seal of approval. I'll tell you that much. Yes, sir. And uh and just so, just so you know, I've totally scripted this. I I did write a script. This is all scripted. You know, I'm not just flying off of the skin of my, of the teeth of my, of the heel of my back. Yeah, I'm not flying by the heel of my back. Yeah. Or is it, wait, wait, heel of my back, seat of my pants. No, 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 that's just not it. Uh, by the knee of my tooth. I'm just flying by the knee of my tooth is what I'm doing. Yes, sir. Yes. And, uh, let's see. What else? Hang on a second. If you hear something that sounds like typing or like clicking a phone, it's it's not me. It's interference. And I'm not, obviously, obviously, I'm, I'm not checking to see how long I've been talking here. That's not Gregor. That's not Gregor. Gregor, Gregor enjoys every moment of this show. It's not like I'm being forced to do this. Not like it's community service. <laughs> Who needs that? Community service. That's another thing. Communities, you know, are just big groups of people. And I don't know. I, Gregor just doesn't know about people. Now, if you're a person, you should like people. I don't say people suck if you're a person. They just suck if you're dead. Or maybe they don't suck. I don't know. Why are you asking? You know what? I'm going to just roll this back. I've talked way too much and said too little in this amount of time. So anyway, get back to the show. And I'll see ya when I see ya. Okay. Bye. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Well, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance... The feeling of being cut off from the world by an insanely jealous man is in the story I want to tell you tonight. A story I call Beauty and the Beast. My story begins in New England on a lonely, desolate cliff overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. 
near the edge of the cliff, which towers 200 feet above the rocks below, a young man stands, a mere shadow in the darkness of the night. Time and time again, he impatiently turns to look at the huge, foreboding old manor house, which is perched near the cliff's edge. Suddenly, out of the darkness, a beautiful girl appears and runs to his outstretched arms. Oh, oh, Kathy, darling, why are you so late? I couldn't slip out of the house any sooner, Alan. Jason was watching my every move. Oh, Kathy, he's twice your age. I know. The ugliest man I've ever known. Whatever made you marry him? I don't know. After my father died, I was all alone. Jason kept after me to marry him. Something in his eyes forced me to say yes. I was afraid to refuse. Well, you're not going on living with him. I'm going to take you away. Oh, Alan, you don't know what you're saying. I can't leave. Why not? If I were to run away, Jason would follow you and kill you. He'd kill you the way he killed... The way he killed... Whom? Well, you remember George Davis, don't you? Why, of course. He was Jason's secretary. Well, one evening, two weeks ago, Jason found me talking to George in the library. A thing he'd forbidden me to do. And the next morning, Jason told me he discharged George and that he'd already left. But then I discovered that all of George's clothes were still in his room. His clothes were in his room? Yes. Surely if he'd been discharged, he'd have taken them with him. Then you think that I'm Jason... sure of it. He must have killed George that very night. He'll kill anyone he thinks is trying to take me away from him. Oh, darling, I couldn't stand to have anything happen to you. <laughs> darling, nothing's going to happen to me, nor to you. I'm taking you away from here. What time can you meet me here tomorrow night? I think I can manage to slip away around nine o'clock. All right, darling, nine o'clock it is. Now you better return to the house before Jason misses you. Where were you, Catherine? Oh, I, I was just out getting some fresh air. You're lying. You slipped out to meet someone. No, Jason, really. I. Oh, <coughs> Jason! My arm! You're hurting me! Who was it? Alan? What did Alan <coughs> tell me? Or I... Beg pardon, sir. But Sheriff Rogers is here to see you. Very well, Charles. Show him in. I'll do all the talking, Catherine. Good evening, Mr. Winthrop. Miss Winthrop. Sorry to intrude, but I must. What can I do for you, Sheriff? I understand you have a secretary, George Davis. I did have. I discharged him two weeks ago. Why are you so interested, Sheriff? Because his body was washed ashore this afternoon, Ooh. 20 miles down the coast. Well? There were deep gashes on the body as though it had fallen from a great height onto the rocks in the sea. It may be suicide, and it may be murder. You say it may be murder? Yeah. Surely you don't suspect I had anything to do with it, do you? I don't know. There have been some mighty strange things happening around here. Four months ago, Sam Arnold, your chauffeur, was murdered, and now... Sam Arnold? Murdered? You seem surprised, Miss Winthrop. Don't you know he was murdered? I'm afraid she doesn't, Sheriff. She's been ill for quite some time, so I kept the news from her. Oh, then she doesn't know that Arnold was stabbed to death less than a hundred yards from this house. Oh, no, no. I thought he'd been discharged... Who... who did it? Well, we haven't found Sam's murder yet, Miss Winthrop. Now we have another mystery on our hands, the death of George Davis. Miss Winthrop, I want you and your wife to be at the coroner's inquest in the village day after tomorrow. Quite a few questions we want to ask you about the deaths of both Sam Arnold and George Davis. There's a lot more going on around here than meets the eye. Dr. Weird's story will continue in a little while. And now I'd Young like... man, before you go on, remember where you are. You know what happens on this program to people who aren't careful what they say. Oh, uh, I'll be careful. I'm always careful. Careful with my facts whenever I talk about Adam Hats. You see, Adam Hats are so downright good-looking, I have to be careful about my enthusiasm. And the makers of Adam Hats are careful, too. Careful to see that every atom is well... Oh, careful, huh? <laughs> you all, you sure weren't careful about that good shoveling aside your head, now were you? No, no. Back to Dr. Weird. Go for it. Now. ho ha And now I'll finish my story, Beauty and the Beast. Twenty-four hours have passed. 
each one of which has been an eternity to Kathy. Try as she would, she couldn't forget the deaths of Sam Arnold and George Davis. One thing seemed perfectly clear to her. Jason had murdered the two men in a jealous rage. He would stop at nothing in his madness. Her mind in a turmoil, Kathy waited tensely for nine o'clock and her meeting with Alan. Catherine, why do you keep looking at the clock every other minute? I, uh, I'm not aware that I am. Is it because you have some secret rendezvous with someone? No, 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 I haven't. You're lying. Whom are you going to meet? Tell me. Oh, Jason, my arm. Oh, tell me. No one, no one. You're lying. I ought to kill you. Yes, kill me. Get rid of me. So I can't testify tomorrow at the coroner's inquest. What are you talking about? You want to kill me because you're afraid of what I might tell them. You, I know you killed Sam Arnold and George Davis. Is that what you intend to tell them tomorrow? Yes, you're nothing but a murderer. Jason. Jason. Don't look at me that way, Jason. I'm not going to let you kill me. Stay away from me, Jason. I won't let you kill me. Put down that poker, Catherine. Put it down, I say. No, if you come any closer, Jason, I'll use it. Jason, don't go I'll use it. I warned you, Jason. I warned you. Kathy, you mustn't cry. You struck Jason in self-defense. Oh, Adam, what are we going to do? We're going through with the plans I've made. I have two tickets in a plane for Mexico, and we're going tonight. Kathy! Jason! Oh, there you are. You're, you're not dead. I didn't kill you. No, the blow you struck me only... Helen, what are you doing here? I've come to take Kathy away, Jason. Helen, you don't know what you're saying. I'm warning you, Jason. Don't try to stop me. You don't understand, Ellen. She's a murderess. She killed two men. What are you saying? I never killed anyone. Ellen, I'm telling you the truth. She killed Sam Arland and George A. Davis. You're lying. You're lying. I didn't. How could she possibly kill two men and not know it? Because she's insane. Insane? A homicidal maniac. There are times when she loses control of her mind. And when she does, she kills. And then she comes to and has no memory of it, I suppose. Yes, yes, that's it exactly. Just a minute before she pushed George Davis off this very cliff we're standing on, I heard her talking to him. Her voice was low, excited. The voice of a homicidal maniac. Before I could reach them, she'd pushed him off this cliff. And then she fainted. And when she regained consciousness, she had no memory of what had happened. No, no, it isn't true, Alan. He's trying to blame me for murders he's committed. Yes, I know, I know, dear. Your story's very clever, Jason. But account rather nicely for the deaths of those two men, wouldn't it? I'm telling you the truth, do you hear? And I'm going to tell it to the coroner's jury tomorrow. I've protected her as long as I can. You're not going to tell the coroner's jury anything tomorrow. Ellen, she's insane. No. She has to be exposed for both our sakes. Right. Ellen, let go of me. Oh, you let don't go, deserve to live trying to make Kathy pay for your crimes. No, no, no Ellen. No, don't. You, you must listen no. to me. Ellen, don't. <laughs> There's no other way out, Kathy. He was insane, utterly insane, trying to make it appear that you murdered Sam Arnold and George Davis when he did it himself. What? He... Alan, what is it? What's wrong? I just remembered something. When Sam Arnold was murdered four months ago, Jason and I were on a hunting trip in Canada. Why, we heard the news together over Jason's portable radio. You mean Jason didn't kill Sam Arnold? I know he couldn't have. But... But it... Jason didn't murder him. Who? Kathy. Alan, why are you looking at me like that? You don't think that I did it, do you? Kathy, if Jason didn't do it, then what he said about you might have been true. You believe that it is true, don't you? I can see it in your eyes. You do believe I murdered Sam Arnold and George Davis, don't you? Kathy, the voice... It's different. You do believe I murdered them, don't you? Your voice is just the way Jason said it was before you pushed George Davis off the cliff. It's true. You did kill him, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. At times like this, I can remember. I killed Sam Arnold with a knife. And I pushed George Davis over the cliff. Would you like to know how I did it, Alan? Kathy, your voice, your eyes... Kathy, what are you up to? I pushed him off the cliff like this, Alan, like this, Kathy, Alan. look out! Alan, I'm slipping out! Ah! Huh? Oh, she's gone. She was trying to kill me. And she fell over herself. She was the murderer. And nobody dreamed of suspecting her. Because she was so beautiful. Alan was 
right. Nobody dreamed of suspecting Kathy because she was so beautiful. But her husband, who was ugly, well, he was suspected right away. You see how handy a pretty face can be? Uh, sometimes. But there's an old saying, beauty is only skin deep. So be careful about walking on cliff tops with lovely young women. One of them might be another catty. Oh, you have to go now. Well, perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weird. Ah, uh, hiya there, folks, and uh, welcome, welcome back to... Uh, Whatever the show is called, it, the name escapes me, honestly. And so tonight's program, uh, the one what we got here is the, uh, the strange Dr. Weird. Woo. So chosen, so chosen, because much like Bumpus, Virginia itself, much like Bumpus, Virginia, you know, they're both strange and friggin' weird. Mm-hmm. And on the subject could use some doctoring. Yep, sure enough. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, that's pretty much all you need to know about tonight's program, folks. Um, strange and weird. I mean, it, like, lasted for, like, a year in the 40s. Most of the scripts are just shorter versions from a more established radio anthology, The Mysterious Traveler. Ooh. And both programs, both programs were hosted by Maurice Turplin. I think it's Turplin, Tur yeah, but I, I guess that's it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, also The Strange Doctor Weird being direct directed by Jock McGregor, who we have mentioned previously on the show, and read in by Robert A. Arthur. <laughs> but enough of that, enough of that. For now, we, 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 we present... What you all have doubtlessly, doubtlessly been waiting for. The origin of the name Bumpus, Virginia. Ho, 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 yeah. Now get a load of this. Get a load of this. So the following information, you know, I, I heard it firsthand, but uh, we also consulted the April 30th, 1905 issue of the Richmond Times Dispatch. Of course, the events of this had happened much earlier. Much, much earlier. Uh -huh. So the story goes, the story goes, old man Bumpus, John T. Well, he had a pretty sizable farm. Yeah, pretty big. And when, what the fellas, when they were running the line for the railroad, well, old John T, he was right objecting uh, to, to the, how, put it any kind of a railroad in. He was. And, and this is an exact quote. I Like, I, I didn't... It's serious. I, I didn't change anything. But he told him, he told him, he says, The cars will run over and kill all my stock. The smoke of the engine will ruin all my crops. The noise of the whistle will run everybody crazy with fear and keep them from sleeping. No, sir, we cannot live. If the blame thing runs through here. Mm -hmm. But the story, no, the story doesn't end there. Oh, oh no, no sorry, It doesn't. For his neighbors then convinced him to allow a easement through his property for the construction of the railroad. But only, only might I add, on the concession that a depot be erected in his honor. Which was of course named Bombus Depot. And, and later shortened and adopted as the name of the area as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yep, Bumpus. That name was adopted as the area as a whole. More of the story. Be a whole. Be an a-hole. A stubborn a-hole. And stuff gets named after you, apparently. Uh, who'd have thunk it? Give, give me a second, folks. I got, I got to find something. Hang on. Where is that? Oh, okay. Got to knock some stuff off the shelves. 
you know, it's, it's ceremonial. Okay, there we go. Because it, it, it's just not, you know, this is an audio program. And it's just not the same. Oh, crap. It, you know, it's just not the same if I'm, like, not knocking stuff off of shelves. Give me, oh, I just had the mic into something. But it's okay. You know, we'll fix it in the e editing. Or, or not. And, and not, it's kind of hard to say. Give me a second. Oh, crap, I'm foaming at the mouth. Oh, it's not rabies. It's just formaldehyde. But, you know, you know, it, it, it's good for you if you're dead. Anyway, um, where was I? I was saying, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, you, you be a hole in a hole and stuff gets named after you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, this was way back when, and I was there. Gregor the Gravedigger was there, still dead. But for whatever reason, you, you know, and it's crazy to me. They didn't name the place Gregor's Depot. Because for some particular reason, they didn't want to run. They didn't. They didn't want to run the railroad through a swamp slash graveyard, graveyard swamp, which is you know where where my property is situated. But but when you think about it, when you think about it, folks, if there ever was a train wreck, I mean, a graveyard, obviously, convenience right there, best place ever. To, to have a train wreck bar none. Location, location, and some mutilation. Okay. But yes, verily, indeed, quite right, quite right. So anyway, uh, long story short, I, I went to John T's farm, and I took a big deuce on his turnip crop. Mm -hmm. And you know what else is weird? Gregor, Gregor... Ah, uh, yeah, what else? Uh, yeah, the, the, the timing of law enforcement, apparently. Gregor, get out here. Look, I'm coming, I'm coming. Deputy boy, <laughs> what timing? I was just about to call you about some mysterious graffiti on my neighbor Morton's house. Very mysterious. And, and cut it, Gregor, cut it, seriously. Gregor, I've had it bound up here with you and your shenanigans. Don't you have, like, anything better to do than spray paint your neighbor's house and send him harassing emails? Ah, uh, come to think of it, well, not, you know, not admitting to anything, but no, no, honestly, no. <laughs> well, at any rate, you need to get your country self a hobby, okay? Hey, hey, hey. I'm not country, I'm rustic. What, what in hell is the difference? I got charm. <laughs> Jeez, uh, Gregor, how many times do we, do we gotta go through this? Y you know, I'm tired, Gregor. I'm tired and... Wait. <laughs> what kind of noise is that? <laughs> You, you, you get, like, a robot or something? Well, actually... Hey, dear Alpha. How you been? Oh, um, you gotta be kidding me. What the hell did you do to me? Ha <laughs> uh, ha, yeah. Like, you, you're liking the new upgrades. Upgrades. These look like jukebox parts. Yeah, I mean, look, you were erupulently, erupulently, you were erupulently damaged. Ow. You, you, you know, uh, well, is this a funny story? Uh, Ah, uh, it's hard to say. Uh-huh. 
But like, like, you know, look, 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 robot. You're a very complex piece of machinery. Yeah, uh, very complex. So it was uh, honestly kind of difficult, you know, and it was like impossible to magic a replacement part. So, you know, we we did the best we could. We, we just pulled some parts off the, you know, the scrap lying randomly all over outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Complex my solid waste unit. Alpha was built in the 1940s. Alpha is mostly non-recyclable aluminum plus vacuum tubes. Alpha's interior is paneled in smut magazines. And Alpha possesses a maximum computing power of a T5 calculator. Well, I mean, look, we, we've already sold that aluminum. <laughs> of course, it's, 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 this is Bumpus, Virginia. Yeah. And obviously, obviously, um, the, the, the non-recycler part uh, ain't exactly my problem. And, um, also, just a side note, 1940s smut magazine's kind of my thing, so yeah, ain't getting those back. Yeah. <laughs> but hey! Hey, hey, buckle up there, buddy. Buckle up. Yes. Look, check this out. Now you can play all these cool 45s, see? <laughs> see? Turn around, don't drown. Your car is not a boat. Turn around, don't drown. Your car, it will not float. So when the water starts to rise, open your eyes, have yourself a plan. Use your head and think, don't let your dreams sink. It's just that easy, you can. Turn around, don't drown. Your car is not a boat. Flood safety at stormwater.charmec.org. What the hell is this? It's not even a local PSA. It's from friggin' North Carolina. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh! Now it's a party! Come on! Everybody, everybody, come! Let's commence to the pumping of the gym! Woo! Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, Gregor, I think that's gonna be a uh, firm negatory for me. Mm -hmm. Wait a second. What the F is this? A muffler. What does a m robot need a muffler for? Yeah, you, you know, you had electric batteries, but, you know, I, I started to think about that. You know, electric batteries... <laughs> Yeah, look to me, ain't cool. They, they just aren't cool. So now you're powered by good old fashioned leaded gasoline. Yes, sir. Alpha could not possibly despise you anymore right now. Hey, hey, hey. Night, night's still early, buddy. We'll see. Anyway, back to the show. And we'll see ya. Sooner than later, uh-huh, and um, onward and so forth and so on. Adam Pat presents The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Your hand is shaking. Surely you're not afraid of me. Perhaps it's the cemetery outside my house that has upset you. Uh, speaking of cemeteries reminds me of a story I want to tell you. A strange murder and a strange burial. The strangest ever known. I call the story Murder 1 Million B.C. <laughs> In a spirit of reverence, 
we of Adam Hat join our fellow Americans and allies everywhere in a tribute of humble gratitude to the brave men and women in our armed forces. Let us pray that they who have brought us so far along the road to freedom have not sacrificed in vain. And finally, let us hope that the end is near, that Japan will soon be defeated, and that our men and women overseas will return to a safe home in a peaceful world. And now for the story on tonight's Adam Hat program, as told by Dr. Weir. My story, Murder One Million B.C., begins in a house on the outskirts of a small city in New Mexico, the home of Professor Timothy Jordan, a renowned scientist, inside his laboratory, engaged upon a mysterious experiment. In the living room, his wife, Florence, and his financial advisor, Harry Smith, confer with each other apprehensively. But, Flo, you say you don't know why Timothy asked me to be here at 11 this morning? No, Harry, I haven't any idea. I'm sure he doesn't suspect anything about us. It must be about his money. Money? What do you mean? Well, you know, I've been handling all his business affairs for the last two years. Yes? Well, a lot of money's been coming in from those new X-ray machines he invented... So much that I didn't think he'd miss a little of it. You mean you've been taking it? Well, just borrowing some of it for some investment that'll make me rich. Harry! He finds out I'm soft. Send me the chair. Will, too. What are you going to do? I don't know, but if you were only out of the way, it could be you and me together always. Be careful. Here he comes. Oh, Harry! Is that you? Uh, yes, Tim. Um, Harry just got here. Oh, good, good, excellent. Harry Flo, I'm about to show you the most amazing thing science has ever achieved. What do you mean, Tim? <laughs> I'm going to show you why I've had to ask you for all that money lately and why I'll need another 100000 immediately. <gasps> another? Come along, both of you, in here in my laboratory. Tim, what's this all about? Tim, darling, this room, all this machinery... What have you been doing in here? Suppose I told you that I've been building a time machine. A time machine? Yes, yes. Look, both of you. You see this big archway of white? A doorway that leads back into the unknown past as far as the year 1 million B.C. Tim, you're not serious. I'm perfectly serious. All I have to do is to close this switch. Now, watch. The archway. It seems to be getting all misty. Yes. That's a sign the current flowing through the, these coils is opening a hole into the past. A hole we can step through as if it were a doorway. Now come. Follow me. And in ten seconds, you'll find yourself on this earth as it was a million years ago. <laughs> Startled, Harry and Florence saw Professor Jordan step into the amazing machine he had built and vanish. Then, fearfully, they followed him and abruptly found themselves standing at his side on hot, dry desert sand. A brilliant sun burned in the sky overhead, and strange birds flew through the air above them. Half a mile away to their left lay a vast body of water in which Monstrous, nightmarish creatures were flashing. Harry and Florence stared about them as if they could not believe their eyes. Tim! Tim, is this real? This is New Mexico, as it was a million years ago. Tim, I don't know what to say. I, I just can't believe it. The past. We've come a million years into the past. And just by stepping back the way we came... We'll be in the present again, in my laboratory, in the year 1940 A.D. Think what that means. Think of being able to watch the burning of Rome, see Columbus discover America, view the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But it'll all be possible as soon as I can get more radium. More radium? Yes, radium provides the power my time machine needs. That's why I have to have $100,000 at once, Harry. Yes, I see. Excuse me, Tim, this... Huh? Stone? Oh, that, that's just sandstone covered with clay. Well, Harry, uh, about the money. There isn't any money. 
No money? What do you mean? Just what I say. You've stolen it. Embezzled it. You'll go to jail, do you hear? I'll send you to the jail if it's the last thing I do. Oh, no, you won't. No, I don't! His head. It's all crushed in. I had to kill him. I had to go to jail. Oh, what are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to bury him right here. But his body, it may be found... Then... Oh, listen, don't you understand? This is a world a million years in the past. We'll bury him at the year in the sand and step back through the time machine into the laboratory. When we get there, he'll have been dead for a million years. Don't you see? He'll have been dead and buried for a million years, and there won't be any body left to be found. There won't be any evidence at all. After Harry had struck down Professor Jordan, he and Flo hastily dug a deep grave in the sand with their hands. They put the body and the blood-stained rock into this grave and covered both with sand. Then hastily they stepped back through the time machine into the laboratory and partly dismantled the machine so no one else could stumble on the secret. Then, after waiting, they announced Professor Jordan's disappearance. Everything went just as Harry planned. It was true that uh, Inspector Leroy of the local police department seemed a little... Uh, Suspicious of Professor Jordan's disappearance. But, of course, he had no evidence. So in due time, Harry and Flo were married. As they were returning from a long honeymoon, Harry said, Flo, I've been thinking about that time machine of Timothy's. What about it, Harry? That machine can make me the richest man on earth. For example, suppose I took it to New York and used it to go back a hundred years. Then suppose I bought up all the land where Times Square now Harry. is. What is it? This clipping Grace Miller sent me. I just opened her letter and... Look at it. Let me see. Bones of ancient man found near residence of late Professor Jordan. While excavating for Highway 37, workmen today found fragments of skeleton of an ancient man buried in a formation of sand and rock. Robert Thompson, state geologist, states geological formation indicates the bones are between 500,000 and a million years old and have been preserved by the extreme dryness of the soil. The great interest of scientists is the fact that a rock... Found beside the crushed in skull of the skeleton was apparently the weapon with which the prehistoric man was killed. Timothy's bones. And the rock you killed him with. Harry, you said there wouldn't be any evidence left after a million years. We have nothing to worry about. Even if they did find a few old bones. Just the same, Harry. Let's not go back home. Let's get off the train, turn around, go someplace far away. That's absurd. In the first place, it would look suspicious if we didn't go back. In the second place, we've got to go back to get that time machine. Because it's going to make me the richest man in the world. Harry succeeded in calming Florence's fears. And next morning they arrived home. They were having breakfast when an unannounced caller, Inspector Leroy, walked in. Uh, good morning, folks. Welcome home. What's the idea of barging in like this, Inspector? Uh, Mrs. Smith, uh, do you recognize this locket which was found and turned into the police department? Locket? Why, that's my gold locket that's been missing for months. But what happened to it? It's a worn scratch. Looks a million years old. Yes, doesn't it? Oh. And we found an inscription inside as good as new, indicating your former husband gave it to you for a birthday present. All right, so it's Florence's locket. So what? As a matter of fact, I want to talk to you about that skeleton which was found out back of this house last week. You know about it, I suppose. Yes, we know about it. So what? It was a very interesting skeleton, Mr. Smith. A million years old, the scientists say. But this locket was found lying underneath it. Oh, no. What? It's impossible. Another thing about that skeleton which is puzzling the scientists, it has gold fillings in its teeth. Gold fillings Professor Jordan's dentist identifies as fillings he put into the professor's teeth himself. Oh, Harry. You're crazy. No, it's the scientists who are going crazy trying to figure out the answers. But I'm no scientist, so I didn't have any trouble. My answer is that that body is Professor Jordan's, and you two killed him and buried him there. And, Mrs. Smith, that's when you lost that luck. No. No, it isn't true. It isn't true. I said you're crazy, and I mean it. Not crazy enough to believe dentists were putting gold fillings in people's teeth a million years ago. Those are Professor Jordan's bones, Smith, and I can prove that you murdered him. You can't. I didn't. Yes. You see, that rock that killed him just fits the wound in the skull, and you know what? 
The killer left his fingerprints on that rock. Fingerprints? It's not possible. But it is. The scientists say that a million years ago, that rock was covered with clay, and that the murderer left four nice, clear fingerprints in the clay. Since then, the clay has hardened to become part of the rock itself, and those four fingerprints, there in that solid rock, match specimens of your prints that I got from your office. How's that for evidence? Fingerprints embedded for all eternity in the solid rock with which a murderer struck down his victim. The jury found Harry and Florence guilty without even leaving the box. The evidence was so conclusive. Of course, nobody believed that Professor Jordan's bones actually had been buried for a million years before they were found. But nobody could explain how Harry's fingerprints came to be embedded in a solid chunk of rock. Perhaps Harry could have, but he didn't dare to, for fear of making matters worse. I remember another scientist who... Oh, you have to go now. Perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery of Dr. Weir. Dr. Weir returns shortly to tell you about next week's story. Meanwhile, here's a thought for all of us. While the war in Europe is over, the war in the Pacific is far from won. Our land troops still have many hundreds of miles of tough island hopping to go and may even have to fight Japan's armies in China. That means we must continue to keep up the flow of ships, guns, munitions, and food to our far-flung Pacific outposts. And that means we must continue to buy bonds. The mighty seventh war loan drive is now on. Let's support it to the utmost. Buy till it hurts, and then some. The Strange Dr. Weird, directed by Jock McGregor, is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. It's presented by the makers of Adam Hatch, the hats that are always top in quality. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. second here. Hang on a second. Hang on. What's going on here? Okay, there. That's better. Oh, yeah. And now we've spoken a little bit. A, a little bit on Bumpus, Virginia. Well, you, you know, it's basically the area between Cuckoo and Beaver Dam. Obviously. Obviously. Anyway, the deputy, the deputy here has since kindly informed me that even folks down in Bumpus, Virginia, probably don't even know where exactly Wickham Corner is. Hmm. Incidentally, incidentally, you know, if Bumpaskins, or, you know, Bumpkins for short, don't even know where Wickham Corner is, then non-locals definitely, yeah, uh, definitely are going to be in the dark. Mm-hmm. So here's a little, a little tidbit, a little tasty tidbit on Wickham Corner, which is in Bumpus, which is in Virginia, which is in that county that that shall not be named. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Wickham Corner, it's like, it's very close to the intersections of like Diggstown Road and Bethany Church Road. And uh, near some other roads, all called Wickham. In, in other words, it's in the woods, it's in the middle of the woods, between Little River Baptist Church in Bethany Crushing Church. Go! Come to think of it, those directions are they're actually probably pretty useless. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and here's a fun fact. Fun fact. 
It's probably named after something, something or somebody named Wickham. Yeah, probably so. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, actually, why am I doing this? Look, hey, deputy, you're, you're a local aficionado of our not-so-fair county. What do you know about uh, Wickham Corner? Uh, well, um, let me see. Oh, yeah, uh. It, it was a site of the third largest drug b bust in the county's history. Ah, uh, oh, uh, uh, You know, actually, on second thought, maybe, maybe you're not the best one to ask about these kind of things. Uh, so, hey, Alpha, Robot, Robot, you, you know anything, anything at all, anything really, like anything about Wacom Corner? I'm a robot. What do you think? Oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But, well, like Wickham Corner, the, you know, Wickham Corner, ooh, the, the name sounds spooky. Uh, and, I, I, you know, I once heard about this, like, weird grave hereabouts all by itself. And the guy, like, wanted to be buried there alone for some strange, mysterious reasons, ooh. Or maybe he just wanted to... Die alone. I get that. Oh, boy. Uh, a robot, maybe you should look into some counseling, buddy. Yeah, oh, boy. Well, well anyway, i got places, B. Are we about to wrap this up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's right about everything. Anyway, we hope you've enjoyed. Yes, enjoyed our little spotlight on our local area. You know, because... Everybody comes from somewhere. You can find us online at weirdhalloween.com. And, you know, to learn more, more about Bumpus, Virginia, you can go to our other site at bumpusvirginia.com. For as long as we are willing to pay for that, though, name, name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> nah, yeah. And I guess I clenches that. Anywho, regards from the... Wait, 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 Gregor. Uh, it, wait just, just a minute, Gregor. You got another robot out there? Another robot? Oh, uh-oh. Gregor, Alpha needs to speak with you and... Wait, who the hell are you? Who am I? Who are you? I am Alpha the Robot. Does not compute. I am Alpha the Robot. Impossible. You must be an imposter. Uh, Greg, just what in hell is going on here? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Funny story. You see, me and reconstructed Robot Alpha here, well, we're from the future. Uh, come again? Yeah, so like, you know, the other episode I mentioned, the one we haven't finished, well, that was supposed to come before this episode, so we, like, time-traveled back to bring you this episode. Hence why, is that an airplane? Ah, oh, boy. Uh, Gregor, you, you, you do this every episode. Can't you just talk over it? Now we can't just talk over the airplane. It shows up on the recording. Okay, give me a second. Yeah, we have a lot of airplanes in Wacom Corner, too. Yeah. And one time I saw a blimp. That was exciting. Yeah. Anyway. So we're like from the future. Hence the alpha of this time period has yet to be re reconstructed because he has yet to be destroyed. In the next episode. On, under mysterious, mysterious circumstances. Ooh. Wait. Alpha gets destroyed. How does this happen? Do you have something to do with that, Gregor? Ah, uh, you know, uh, that's not really important. Not important. No, 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 not at all. The hell it isn't. Okay, Gregor. Well, this is sure getting weird. But if the robot uh, of this time 
is here, then shouldn't there be like a Gregor of this time too? <laughs> oh, well, uh, funny story about that too. Hey, what the hell, man? Whoa, easy with my closet door. Pal. It's my closet door. Hey, I, uh, okay, whatever, semantics, but how did you even get out of all that duct tape I wrapped you up in? Uh, oh, 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 you, you want to know? How do you think? I had to eat my way out. Now I'm going to be cropping out duct tape for a week. Did you just ever stop to think about that? I mean, you know, I did, I did. But hey, man, I figured, you know, that's future me's problem. Dude, you are future me. Oh, oh yeah, that's that's right. I guess that's true. You know, strangely feels like I need to take like I need to take a really weird dump. Hmm. Weird. Ah, uh, but you know, you know, I'll worry about that. I, I guess I'm worrying about that now now. Uh, anyway, I think my job's about done here. Come on, robot. Oh! Oh, oh, you you're gonna go oh contraire! I, I don't think so, buddy. You just locked me up in a closet. Oh, oh, you, you, you don't think so, buddy? Well, you know what? My shovel says I'm definitely going, pal. Oh, yeah? Well, my shovel says I'm about to scramble your brains, buddy. Oh, seriously, good heaven, are we actually going to do this? What, what do, do you, you think? think? Uh, well, I... I, I... Well, well, I guess I'm, yeah, you know, I, I'm just going to stand to the, by the side, I guess. I'm not sure where the law stands about assaulting your future self. Oh, boy. Robot, give us a count. One, two, one, three, two, one. Okay, okay, I think that's enough. Why, why don't we just, you know, let's just put in some music to calm ourselves down, you know, calm down nerves. Uh, Robot, actually, yeah, Robot, can you help us out with that? Affirmative. No. No, no, you idiot! Don't play it backwards! Stop before you you stupidly summon something! Uh, well, you know, on the sunny side, I guess... Whatever that is out there. Well, it's past me's problem. Gregor! You can be such a jerk sometimes. I, I mean, I think you mean we can be such a jerk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Funny. Oh, well, I guess that's about it. Anyway, you want to, or should I? You, you know, you know, Gregor, let, let's just do it together. Okay, you know, that might be fun. Okay. Regards from, the, from grave. the graveyard. And, and see you in the, the fear after. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Actually, you know, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Be be before we go, I just want to address. There's been some rumors going around that Gregor the Grave Digger stole the Sex 18 sign off of the road by backing up into it with his truck. I would just like to say, I I, I just like to say, in response to that, uh, I would like to say, what are you, a cop? Ah. Anyway. 
Happy loving Bumpus Virginia. Two three zero oh, two forever. See ya. Turn around, don't drown. Your car is not a boat. Turn around, don't drown. Your car, it will not float. So when the water starts to rise, open your eyes. Have yourself a plan. Use your head and think. Don't let your dreams sink. It's just that easy. You can turn around, don't drown. Your car is not a boat. Flood safety at stormwater.charmac.org. And now, Mr. Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, what are your favorite stories? If there is one you're particularly fond of and would like to hear on the air, will you please write me about it? But always remember, ladies and gentlemen, there are werewolves. There are vampires. Such things do exist. Mm.